What's up, everybody? Spencer Lazara here, MMA interview. Just froze. <laughs> Busy schedule back in the camp, man. Right away, uh, huge win last weekend. Talk to us about the feeling when you when you got your hand raised with the decision. Um, I was completely elated, man. I was just so excited to get a a, a big win, and uh, you know when you're when they gave me the shot to be in the tournament, um, you know I was really excited. But once you get the first win, you really feel like you're deep in the tournament, and uh, you know it. It hit me right away, everything all at once. I was really pumped. Especially fighting a guy like Diego, who has, you know, maybe is the favorite coming into the tournament, and even though he's he's off of a couple losses, you know, he has that name. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, and that was always in the back of my mind, too. So, uh, you know, that's that's why it meant so much to me, and that, I, I think that's why I'm getting a lot of attention right now. Uh, I, was, I was definitely probably the biggest underdog um, in terms of matchups in the first round. Um, but, you know, a, a lot of people didn't know me, so it, the guy you don't know is usually the most dangerous. I know you had a good win over a guy that I'm familiar with down from Alliance, Nick Piedmont as well. I mean, he, he's, he's a quality uh, quality talent himself. Yeah, yeah. Our fight was uh, it was short, but um, it was really action-packed. Uh, Nick hit me with some good shots. He has good, uh, good range, and uh, he was hitting me, like, in the back and side of the head and stuff like that, and, uh, you know, I finally found my timing. And um, I saw my opening. I I took advantage. Uh, I was talking with Nick. I know you train with Nick Newell, and and he was saying, you know, despite this fight being mostly striking, you're you're more of a submission uh, ground guy. Yeah, I like submissions. That's my favorite. Um, uh, most of my wins, most of my finishes are by submission. Um, but uh, you know, in training, you hold back with the strikes. You you don't really have to hold back with the submissions because the person will say tap. But you know, a lot of times. Uh, you hold back with the strikes, and um, a lot of my, a lot of the reason why I got into fighting was for one, I have a good a good chin and I'm tough, but two, I I, I hit really hard, and uh, you know you hold back in training, but um, I think I, I lost myself somewhere in the middle of my fights, uh, maybe like six seven fights in, and I tried to change my game into like a grappling game, this and that, game planning, but I I finally found. Um, myself again, and, and and what I'm comfortable with, and and that's throwing big shots and, and standing and trading and having a good time doing that. Rip, talk about how how badly hurt you had him in the second, and and you didn't seem to go quite as aggressively as I expected. I thought maybe a finish was imminent there. Um, talk about that. Yeah, uh, finishes are really difficult when the person's running away from you. <laughs> um, he he wasn't standing in the pocket after I hit him. You know, he as soon as I hit him, I went to rush in and he dove at my feet. You know, so right away I then had to sprawl and look for uppercuts. And as soon as I did, he he backed away. I went to clinch and throw some knees, and he he ran away. And he kept on backpedaling, backpedaling, backpedaling. So it was uh, you know, what I didn't want to do is I didn't want to go in a hundred thousand percent and get caught with the knee. You know what I did? Like like in the first round, because I know he's been there before. He's been hurt in fights before, and he's He's able to gather himself, so I didn't want to go in there uh, right after I heard him and just go nuts, you know, and, and possibly get caught while doing it. Did you feel like, um, you know, I know you rewatched the fight, said you felt like you had enough to win, but they're in the cage when they're about to read the decision. <laughs> what's your feeling? How confident are you that you're going to get your hand raised, especially considering, like you said, you are a heavy underdog? Yeah, uh, no, I was really confident that I, I, I won the, the second and third round. The second one was absolutely mine. Um, and then the third round was really close, but uh, when you're in the fight, you feel the exchanges, you feel where you're hitting him, and he's not hitting you, and uh, every single one that he attacked me with, um, I countered with a combination. Uh, anytime um, I attacked him, I was able to hit him with two, three strikes at a time, so if you're counting significant strikes there, um, my count was a little bit uh, heavier than his, and uh, it, it felt like it in the fight, and if I watched the video again, and uh, I could see, um, I could see that definitely won the third round too. The first round uh, was close until the knee. Um, I don't know how the the judge scored at thirty twenty seven. Uh, I think I said in a different interview that maybe the judge didn't see um, the knee land and maybe thought I slipped or something like that. But um, you know, I, when you're like I said, when you're in the fight, you know if you've won a round or not. And uh, I didn't feel like I won. 
the first round. Yeah. Um, we'll talk about your, your next opponent. and All right, uh, March 28th. Yeah, Daniel Weichel, I think that's how you say it, Daniel Weichel. Um, he's a beast, man. He's He clearly has the biggest resume, 40 professional fights. He's fought a who's who in MMA. He's been fighting since he's 17. Uh, he's got that experience factor on me. Um, you know, but everybody's got a chin, everybody's got a neck. And, uh, you know, whether, whether I'm attacking submissions or I'm attacking uh, his jaw, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to constantly, I'm gonna constantly go at him. So uh, a lot of times... Uh, whether I'm going forward or going backwards, I'm always waiting um, for my opening, and, and I create the opening by movement. And um, you know, he'll he'll leave an opening somewhere, and I'm going to take it. I'm going to take advantage. Talk about your your background um, and how you got into the sport and and whatnot. <laughs> I don't have a background. Uh, I started training uh, just a few short months before my first pro fight, and. Um, I actually didn't even know there were uh, professional or amateur MMA. I just uh, I signed up. I was like, I want to get into uh, an MMA fight. I want to get in a cage. And they signed me up, and it turned out to be pro. And then uh, obviously once you go pro, you can't go amateur. So <laughs> my first uh, my first five fights probably were uh, you know not even out of a gym. Or if it was out of a gym, I was training like two days a week. Uh, didn't really have any striking whatsoever. And everything. I never wrestled growing up. So everything was just like, Hard nose, uh, hit you harder than you hit me, type stuff. Wow, that is crazy, man. Um, yeah. How old were you when you had your first fight? Then uh, I think I was twenty-two. It was two thousand and seven, September two thousand and seven. Were you? Did you have other sports? Though I assume because you're an athletic, you, you're a well-built guy. Did you play a lot of other stuff growing up? Yeah. Um, yep. I played baseball, basketball, football, soccer. Um, every sport that I could get my hands on. I was always out of the house when I was younger. I mean, I liked video games. I liked playing them, but, you know, my mom would set a curfew because and, like, have to whistle out the door every single day, Matthew, come home, Matthew, come home. And then she, I, would get a, I would get in trouble if I didn't come home right away. So, uh, I mean, I loved being outside. I loved playing sports. I was always active. And, uh, you know, I, I found MMA a little bit late in life, but I've always been active and always um, enjoyed competition. So uh, it fit right in with my lifestyle. Yeah, I mean, we see a lot of other athletes coming into the sport and, and having success. Do you feel like that athleticism is something that gives you uh, a distinct advantage? Yeah, for sure, sure. Um, and especially with my style, too, because I like to constantly move and, um, you know, constantly uh, adapt and change angles. And uh, because of my agility, flexibility, um, and, and confidence with my own body and how I move, uh, I'm able to implement my game a large majority of the time. Mm -hmm. Nice, man. Well, I know that we have a good story. Nick was telling me about that you uh, you went in and, and had to play hero recently to a family. You want to tell us this story? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, I was on my way to um, uh, the doctor's to fill a prescription, and uh, I'm driving past, I think it was either Walgreens or Rite Aid. I believe it was Walgreens. And uh, on my left, I go through an intersection, and I see this um, this van like going backwards down a maybe like a ten foot embankment. And I'm like, "What is this person doing?" Kind of like looked over at him, like this person's crazy. And um, they're going backwards down it, and I, and I look over and I see that there's nobody in the in the in the driver's seat. And I see a little girl, maybe like eight years old, in the passenger seat. And I'm like, "Holy crap, what's going on?" So I just pulled the car over and sprinted down the road as it was like heading into traffic backwards into traffic and I run over and like the car is still move or the van is still moving open the door or I try to open the door and it's locked so I reach in through the back seat and I see that there are three children even younger ones in a car seat in the back seat and I'm like holy crap so I reach in unlock the door from the back open the the, the driver's side door hop in stop the car put on the hazards and uh, started stopping traffic and then uh, I got Back in the car, and the little girl was frantic in the front seat, crying. The little, the three kids in the back were just, you know, in shock, and they they weren't saying a word, just kind of like open mouth and awe. And uh, I ended up stopping the car like right next to the middle of the intersection, and uh, in oncoming traffic in a, in a four way, um, light intersection. It pretty was pretty busy cool. street. I mean, thirty five mile per hour zone or. 
Um, yes. Yeah, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a 45 or a 55. It was, it was probably Still, 35. That's not... I mean, I was probably speeding, because usually I speed, but... <laughs> it was, so, it was probably 35. So the mom comes out and is like... Yeah, um, well, I told the little girl that was, you know, maybe eight-ish, um, to go inside. I'd wait outside with the, the three kids to go inside across the street to, to Walgreens, get her mother, and she comes out, running out, and she's, she's really upset, and, uh, she seemed a little off. I don't know why, but she's like, I, I, I mean, I, I didn't know that would happen. This isn't my car. I rented the vehicle. Um, I don't know how that could have happened. And she thanked me several times and uh, told me that the reason they, she left the kids in the car was because um, they were sick, so she didn't want to ha have them come inside and blah, blah, blah. It was, it was weird. Um, when, when I got in the car, it was in, what was that, reverse or neutral? I think it was in, it was in reverse. And the and the keys were in the ignition. I don't I didn't quite understand why that was, but um, I don't know if the little girl bumped in, into reverse or what. But there was like coffee all over the inside of the car because it was you know jarring around going back down down this hill. So I mean it was a it was a, uh, a weird situation that uh, I'm just glad everybody was all right. Wow, man, that's that's pretty intense. So no police showed up. You didn't get any accolades for this. You just ended up being the the, the hero on your own. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, right after that, I was just like, all right, thank you. I gotta go fill a prescription and then just jet. Gnarly, man. Well, that's an awesome story. That's good stuff. Nice. As much as you do in the cage, it's nice to uh, give back uh, outside it, right? Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> well, how was the cold out there? Um, is it tough to, to deal with that? I, I'm, a, I'm a West Coast guy, man. I'm spoiled. So. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm used to it. I, I grew up in it. I lived here my whole life. Cold's not cool. We're waiting for the warm weather, but, um, you know, sometimes you miss training days because you can't go anywhere because there's so much snow, and, uh, you know, you got to make up for it elsewhere. But, you know, for the most part, I, I'm used to it. I'm used to the snow. Kind of cut out right there. I don't know if you asked the question. Talk about uh, your team and training partners that you work with a lot. Oh, um, well, I train at Underdog Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, there's a lot of guys that come through there. Um, uh, most of the guys um, on the MMA team just love to stand and bang. And then uh, we got some really good strikers that people just don't know. And uh, a lot of good kickers, too. That's why I was prepared for Diego so well. Um, got, Diego kicks really well, but... There's a couple guys on our team that are just like, just so much better than Diego kicking. Um, it seemed like you actually got the better of the of the, in the kicking department in this fight. Yeah, yeah, and and I, you know, I credit that to uh, just repping out kicks and seeing kicks from all angles from my 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 good training partners. Um, I also go, I travel all around New England to uh, places like uh, tonight. I'm going to Triforce MMA where uh, Brennan Ward trains. Um, Pete and Keith Jeffrey own the place. It's a real good place. Good, good for sparring. Um, I go to New England Combat, um, Jorge Rivera's gym, RIC. Um, I go to. I've gone to Y Crew several times with John Howard. Um, and 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 mainly I go to uh, Underdog and I go to Fighting Arts Academy with uh, Nick Newell and Jeremy Lubaschewski. Yep. Nice. Um, talk about the, the mindset getting out of a fight like that and then going right back into another one. I mean, I, it was a hard fought fight, three rounds, and <clears throat> were, are you banged up? Like, what you know, what's the thought process in terms of health? Did you want to take at least a week off, sort of at least take it easy and let your body heal? It's very weird. Um, I've never had to do this before. <laughs> so uh, I, I don't want to lose my cardio, especially because I'm fighting at high altitude. Uh, so it's it's... It, it's kind of like uh, I just got to jump right into it, and like if I'm a little sore here and there, I mean I'll get I'll get through it. Um, that's usually how fight camps are anyway. Like you just keep training no matter what. Um, I don't have any like bad concussion or anything like keeping me from sparring. So just a few bruises here and there, and uh, you know I I've, I've lightened up on the uh, the training this week, but I'm still hard on the cardio. So uh, and then. Um, the following two weeks, I'm going to be training in uh, Denver, Colorado, um, at high, al high altitude with uh, uh, at the Grudge Training Facility. Nice. Yep. And then you just stay up there leading up to the fight, I guess, and then just 
Yeah, yeah. Um, hopefully we're flying out. We're trying to finalize the tickets right now, but hopefully we're fly flying out this Sunday, and I'll be there for the two weeks, and then uh, Bellator flies me from Colorado to Utah. And, uh, you know, my, my game is constantly go, 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 go. And uh, it's I'm not going to let altitude change that. I'm going to go, 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 go. Yeah. Talk about the, the title picture. We've got uh, the rematch, I guess, and then you've got Pitbull waiting in the wings as well. I mean, thoughts on the rest of the division? Um, the, I, I, would, I would watch Strauss. I'm, I'm sorry. I would watch uh, Pat Curran fight every weekend. The guy's just fun to watch. He's got ex excellent striking. He's very dynamic. And um, you know what? I think uh, I think that he gets his belt back, and I think that Kern fights um, Patricio again, and I think uh, Patricio finally gets the victory that that uh, he may have deserved in the first one. It was a close fight, but uh, I think Patricio is going to be the the next champion in like the next six months. So, I feel like it's a good matchup for you against him. I mean, it's a guy <laughs> who, who's you know I guess similar in some ways to Diego, a little more power maybe. Yeah, he's very similar. Only um, I th he I think he has uh, he has holes that Diego doesn't have, and Diego uh, and I see stuff in it. And um, he actually moves a lot like me, but he does have a, a lot more power than the average 145er. That's for sure. Um, I mean, every fight I'm excited to fight, and whoever's anything in front of me. Want... My bad. Uh, anything else you want to say? <clears throat> um. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Thank you to um, everybody in the Northeast that has been showing me um, all the support over the years and especially um, for this fight in the biggest fight of my life. And uh, I hope you guys continue to follow me as I uh, take on Daniel Weichel in the uh, next round of the Featherweight Tournament. Beautiful. Give this man a follow, Mangler BJJ on Twitter. And uh, we look forward to seeing that, man. Utah, March 28th, live on Spike TV. Thanks for the time, Matt. That's right. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. All right.